Dr. Martin Luther King went to jail 29 times in his life for actions that were illegal, but not immoral. Susan B. Anthony knew full well that it was illegal for her to vote in 1872, but she did it anyway. Gandhi was legally obligated to pay that salt tax. Oscar Schindler was not allowed to protect Jewish people from Nazis. Malala was not supposed to speak out against the Taliban. Unjust laws, rules, and norms are bound to be broken by morally developed people. Psychologists study how morality develops in people and have found that it appears to unfold over stages and in each stage, the determination of right versus wrong is based on different factors. The question is, what do people look to as a guide to navigate moral dilemmas. In the earliest stages of moral development evident in young children, right versus wrong is determined by what is punished. Young children are most oriented toward wanting to avoid punishment and tend to consider anything that would attract punishment to be wrong. What tends to come next is an orientation toward reward, where the guiding principle to determine right versus wrong action is what will be rewarded. The stage that follows this is known as approval orientation, which is quite similar to reward orientation, but the reward is not as concrete as a lollipop for good behavior, but rather becomes the reward of social approval. Kids learn that the world is generally more accepting of kindness than meanness. So they reason that this is why it is right to be kind, because other people approve of that. Notably, a person in these early stages of development can easily be manipulated into engaging in clearly immoral acts if their social world is hateful. For example, the white supremacist Hail our people! Hail victory! and morally repugnant Richard Spencer has two kids. Imagine what their conditioning looks like at home. Imagine what statements and actions are reinforced and approved of. Using racial slurs at the dinner table in their twisted little world may very well feel to these kids like the right thing to do. This approval-oriented stage of moral development is based on conformity to the in-group. For people in this stage, the approval of whatever group whose acceptance they seek is their guiding light to determine right from wrong. The next stage of moral development is based on authority. Right and wrong is determined by some external authoritative source, such as the law of the land, religious texts, leaders, or the rules of the organization. The basic belief is that the authority is the source of accurate moral judgment and knows better than me about what is right. So imagine someone at this authority-oriented stage of moral development who looked to the law of the land as their moral authority and they lived in the Jim Crow South in the 1960s. They would have no qualms about racial segregation, especially if it benefited them. Such a person would readily stop protesting against segregation when authorities said to do so. Well, Dr. Martin Luther King and so many others who non-violently demanded for equal rights had advanced beyond the authority-oriented stage of moral development. In his profound letter from a Birmingham jail in 1963, which was addressed to his critics who were anxious about King's willingness to break laws, he wrote, there are just laws and there are unjust laws. An unjust law is no law at all. A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Any law that uplifts the human personality is just. Any law that degrades the human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. 
At the highest stage of moral development, people look toward their own conscience to determine right and wrong and look for universally beneficial ethical principles. Injustice, whether it is felt directly or not, becomes deeply bothersome to the morally advanced. People start to consider the adherence to unjust laws, rules, and norms to be a moral failing and see clearly that indeed, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This stage of moral development often accompanies a willingness or eagerness to engage in civil disobedience. Dr. Martin Luther King was told by authorities to stop organizing protests, but this was a rule he could not justify obeying. I could have gone home. Oscar, there are 1,100 people who are alive because of you. Look at them. Oscar Schindler, the subject of the movie Schindler's List, was a businessman who saw dollar signs during the Nazi agenda to remove Jewish businesses. He purchased a formerly Jewish-owned manufacturing plant and set up shop, actually employing a number of Jewish people. He was also a member of the Nazi party and mingled with high-ranking SS members. But the whole situation began to weigh on his conscience and the brutal treatment of Jewish people hurt his soul because he actually had one. Schindler's goal of making money gave way to a resolve to rescue as many Jewish people as he possibly could from the clutches of Nazi executioners. They say that no one dies here. They say your factory is a haven. They say you are good. When his Jewish employees were threatened with deportation, he would claim exemptions for them and argue that these employees were essential to his business, which, being an ammunition manufacturer, was important to the war effort. Schindler would falsify records to make it look like children and housewives were actually expert mechanics. He allowed Jewish people to sleep at his factory overnight. He used his social status to directly prevent the imprisonment and murder of Jewish people on many occasions. He had many heroic acts throughout the hell of the Holocaust, almost all of which involved breaking laws and disobeying Nazi commands. He literally spent all of his money and he put his own life on the line to protect Jewish people. He's credited with saving the lives of about 1,100 Jewish people who, by the year 2012, were estimated to have at least 8,500 descendants. Had Schindler's moral development been stuck at earlier stages, he would have gauged right versus wrong by fearing punishment, seeking reward or approval from his Nazi friends, or relying on authorities, and he would have succumbed to the same moral retardation of a typical Nazi. Instead, his morality developed. He found his source of moral guidance in his own conscience and in the principle of human dignity. When asked why he did what he did, Oscar Schindler replied, I hated the brutality the sadism, and the insanity of Nazism. I just couldn't stand by and see people destroyed. I did what I could, what I had to do, what my conscience told me I must do. In the war, um, the girls are going to their schools freely and there is no fear. But uh, in Sawat, when we go to our school, we are very afraid of Taliban. He will kill us, he will uh, throw acid on our face and he can do anything. When Malala Yousafzai was blogging about the terrors of the Taliban and speaking out publicly against their ban on girls' education, she knew she was breaking their rules. Now, no one in their right mind thought this ban was morally acceptable, but the threat of punishment was so severe and real that few spoke or acted out against it. Malala is such a hero because she rebelled against these immoral rules knowing that it would compromise her own safety. I did not want to be silent because I had to live in that situation forever. Swat Veli! And it was a better idea because otherwise they were going to kill us. So it was a better idea to speak and then be killed. And she came as close as one can come to dying 
for her advocacy. It's very hard to see how the Taliban member who shot 15-year-old Malala thought he was doing the right thing, but he probably did think that. People like this are desperate for acceptance from their group, pathetically obedient to their authority figures, and thoroughly deranged in their worldview. I think one of Malala's most powerful statements is, the extremists are afraid of books and pens. The power of education frightens them. They are afraid of women. I'm just a committed and even stubborn person who wants to see every child getting quality education, who wants to see women having equal rights, and who wants peace in every corner of the world. Speaking of being afraid of women, prior to 1920, most men saw nothing wrong with the fact that no women were allowed to vote in elections. Authorities from many disciplines affirmed to the public that this was morally justifiable for women just weren't as reasonable as men. Susan B. Anthony knew differently. On election day in 1872, she marched to the polls and casted her vote. She was arrested two weeks later. Of course, it took 48 more years before white women were allowed to vote and almost a hundred more years before all American women were allowed to vote. But Susan B. Anthony's vote that day was ultimately a defiant vote for equality. Mahatma Gandhi went to jail four times in his life for doing right in the face of wrong. His most dramatic act was leading the Salt March. So the British Salt Act of 1882 prohibited Indian people from collecting or selling salt and forced them to purchase it from their British rulers who also added a hefty tax onto it. Breaking this unjust law was the right thing to do for Gandhi. It would be a symbol of resistance to colonization and of India's fight for independence. On March 12, 1930, Gandhi set out from his ashram with about a dozen followers. Over three weeks, he walked 240 miles to the ocean. Attracted hundreds of thousands of followers, arrived at the Arabian Sea on April 3rd, and proudly defied British law by harvesting salt from the ocean. He and about 60,000 others were arrested. It's important to note that these leaders didn't just break the law. They broke it with clear intentions and with a clear message, all while following the moral principle of nonviolence. Sometimes existing order needs to be disrupted, but not by devolving into chaotic mobs with no clear strategy, rather through organized strategic action with a very clear aim. If England does not grant your demand, are you prepared to return to jail again? I am always prepared to return to jail. <laughs> On the night before the march, Gandhi implored his followers, let there be not a semblance of breach of peace, even after all of us have been arrested. We have resolved to utilize all our resources in the pursuit of an exclusively non-violent struggle. Let no one commit a wrong in anger. Intolerance of injustice is a mark of moral maturity. The psychology of the most morally developed people not only compels noble action, but compels courageous acts of disobedience when laws and rules are unjust, and brings about an unwillingness to conform to immoral norms. Our society isn't fraught with immoral laws like it used to be, and many moral dilemmas are not black and white like oppression is, but our cultures and subcultures may have within them immoral norms and injustices that manifest on microscopic levels in your social circle, which you can address. So where do you look to judge right from wrong? Can your conscience guide you, even if it must emerge from the muck of your conditioning? 
Do you know what the right thing to do is? And can you do the right thing? Even when no one else is looking? Even when no one else is telling you what to do? If you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe.